Uh, just to make you smile a little bit, I read this the other day. A pancake, two eggs, and a sausage walked into a bar. The bartender said, sorry, we don't serve breakfast. <laughs> but my favorite that I read this week was this one. Three elephants jumped out of an airplane. Two landed on the land, and one lands in the water. But um, tsh. That was the joke, I assume. Can't think about it. You know, we could try to scare ourselves to death about complaining. There are scriptures that condemn complaining, and we could go there when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, Numbers 11 and verse 1. Numbers 14, 29, they complained against me, and they shall fall in the wilderness. Or 1 Corinthians 10, 10, some of them also complained and were destroyed. So I suppose we could try scaring ourselves to death to stop complaining. And I don't think that works. It helps a little bit, but it doesn't really get the job done. We can try encouraging ourselves to rejoice. Uh, Lamentations, which you wouldn't think Lamentations would have something positive in it. But Lamentations 3 and verse 39, we should, why should a living man complain? We, and his point is we all sin. And God's treated us better than we deserve. How should we complain? Psalm 103 verse 10 he has not dealt with us according to our sins. Why should we complain? He hasn't even given us what we really deserve. And it's not better than what we've got. It's worse than what we've got. Uh, Philippians 4 and verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So we could encourage ourselves by saying we should rejoice. It's better than we deserve and we should rejoice in it. But I'm not sure that sticks either. Quite honestly, it helps, but it doesn't stick it. Uh, or maybe we could get to the root, which I think the root of complaining is contentment. First Timothy 6 and verse 6 says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. And verse 8, it says, Having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, Be content with such things as you are. Yes, contentment is the opposite of complaining, but telling you to be content doesn't work. Contentment in all states is not a natural propensity of the human race. We are not naturally contented, apparently. The truth is, is that we are apparently naturally not contented. You know, weeds grow in the ground. They grow in the ground naturally. Thorns come up naturally. It's a part of the curse of God. You don't have to go out and plant weeds this week. We don't, we don't need to get some thorn seeds and go out and plant them. They come up naturally. But if you, if you want something positive to come up, you actually have to work at it. You don't have to teach people to be negative. People can be negative without any help whatsoever. It's not a problem to be negative. But if you want wheat to come up, you have to prepare the soil, you have to cultivate it, and you have to work at it a good bit. Flowers come up after you've planted them and you've worked around them and you keep taking care of them. Contentment is one of those flowers of heaven that just don't, doesn't come up naturally. We have to cultivate it. And sometimes we have to learn how to cultivate it. We don't know. But sometimes what happens is we're like Paul. I don't know if you've noticed it, but the text that was read, Paul said he had learned to be content. He was born content. He wasn't baptized and became content. He didn't go to church one day and suddenly he was content. He had to learn to be content. And that means that uh, once he didn't know how to be content, even when he was an apostle. Hmm. So it cost him something to attain to the mystery. It didn't come easy. He probably at one point thought he had learned and then had to back up on that. Any of y'all been there? Thought you learned what it was to be content and then 
all of a sudden found yourself complaining about everything? He probably got there. But you see now, Paul is kind of an older guy now. Probably got quite a few gray hairs. And he may be nearing the grave. He is a prisoner in a Roman prison. And suddenly he has attained to the discipline required to achieve contentment. See, contentment takes learning and it takes discipline. Uh, contentment is not in a simple sermon with three points. And it's not in the answer to one prayer. And if that's what you're looking for, you'll never attain to it. You will never reach contentment. Contentment requires a process. It occurs over the process of time. And if you're not trying for it, you won't achieve it. You don't raise wheat without planting it. You have to work at it. So I want to give you four areas quickly. This is the whole lesson right here. I got most of these ideas from a guy you might have heard of, C.H. Spurgeon. And I thought it was some of the best stuff I've seen in this. How to change complaining to contentment. And this is how Paul apparently did it. He learned these four things. Let's talk about those four things just a moment. He had learned, he had to learn, and you have to learn to be abased. You want to be content? If you're not content today, it may be because you haven't been stepped on enough. Hello? You sure you want to be content? Paul learned how to be abased. A Philippians 4 verse 11 and 12 says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. You know, when all men honor us, it's easy to be content. Who can't be content with everybody saying, oh, you're such a wonderful person. But when scorn takes your character and it holds it in repute as if you're some low person, when men hiss your name, it requires a deeper knowledge of Christ to endure that with not just patience, but with cheerfulness. You recall that Paul learned that quite well. He was treated as the least of all the apostles, if he were an apostle at all. And he was treated as a traitor by his own people. He had learned to be abased. Now, when we grow in rank and in the honor of successes, Oh, it's easy to be content. You who have suddenly become elders, it's easy at first to be content. You who suddenly become deacons, you've attained to something. You who had a great sale at work, who can't be content when the successes roll? But you notice John the baptizer, he learned that he must decrease when others were going to increase. Can you handle that one? You see, when others advance to your place and you are dropped lower, other men receive a fellowship and a welcome that maybe you long for, but you're not going to receive. It's not easy to sit still without envy and say like Moses, would to God that all of his people were prophets. Not everybody can do that because they've not learned to be abased yet. You want to learn contentment, buckle up. <laughs> you got to learn to be abased. When we are recognized for our labors, it's easy to be content. Oh, you did such a great job. Who can't handle that? I believe we can all say, I feel contented when people are saying, I did a great job. But what if the other guy who didn't do as much as you is praised and you're not mentioned. What about if you're mocked by your rivals by exalting the other guy who didn't do nearly as good as you? You had that? Can you learn to be abased and bear it with joy? See, it's one thing to say, oh, I can handle that. But can you handle it with joy? Can you be content when that's happening? You want to learn contentment? Are you sure? 
Oh, I want to be content. Lord, answer it right now. I'm not sure you want him to answer that right now, but if you could learn to be content, you must learn to be abased. When we can lay all honors down as willingly as we took them, if we can lay them all down as cheerfully to submit to Christ as we took them when he gave them to us, when we can submit to the humble school that we've got to go to now and do it with a smile on our face, we're starting to learn contentment, and it is the, at the school of being abased. When we've learned to go downward in order that Christ may ascend upward and be glorified, then we're starting to learn to be abased, which is a critical ingredient to learning to be content. The second thing is he had to learn to be abundant. It's not the easiest thing to learn, by the way. If you look at verse 12, it says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. You know, when abased souls obtain abundance, they may think, well, now they are content. I didn't have much, but now I have. Now I'm content. But you may know a little about being abased, but you may know nothing about being abundant. You know, a lot of people can be Joseph, and they can be put in that pit and still look up at the sky and believe in the starry promises of God. A lot of people could do that. But not everybody can be lifted from there to the pinnacle without it making your head dizzy. When a base souls obtained abundant power or abundant position, sometimes they think, now I'm contented. But you see, great students sometimes make horrible teachers. Great deacons sometimes make horrible elders. Aggie, you got quiet on that one. That's... Great Christian Bible students sometimes make horrible preachers. Great second violinists sometimes make horrible first violinists. Preachers have been exalted often way above what they can handle. You can't, you say, well, now I've arrived. It might be the best thing in the world for you not to get there. You might not can handle it. So when a base souls obtain abundance, they may think that their struggles are all over. But I, I'm going to tell you something, folks. You might be rich and increased with goods, and suddenly think you have no need of anything or anyone. You may think you're finally content because now you got plenty of money in the bank, you got enough vehicles, your house is taken care of, everything's fixed, you don't have one thing left on your honeydew list. Liar, liar, pants on fire, but anyway. Because, and suddenly what happens is you might become something else. See, man who has sprung up from nothing to wealth often becomes proud and intolerant of others. If you're not careful, you may end up thinking you have the blood of Caesars pumping through your veins. That he doesn't need his old acquaintances anymore. He's attained to something better. And often that's the people who become tyrants, who only have a lust for power. The only reason they want to be an elder or the only reason they want to be a deacon or the only reason they want to be someone at church is because they've never had power and so they want to have power so they can push people around. Oh, don't look at me funny. I've seen it too many times. But you see, Paul lost. That means he had something. You remember he said, I've suffered the loss of all things and do count it as dung. Now, folks, you have to have something to experience loss. If you ain't got nothing and you lose your toothpick, it's not the end of the world. But if you've got something and you lose it, it affects you. Paul had something. I don't know what he had, but he had more than nothing and he lost it. He had Abundance at one point, apparently. So when we 
can receive honor and our fortune and still humbly kneel before Christ and all other men. Did you get that? Oh, it's easy to kneel before Christ, but kneel before all other men and humbly use whatever abundance we have for the cause of Christ and that benefits all other men. You see, that's when you're beginning to learn contentment. You're beginning to learn the message of abundance. When we have learned to go upward in order that Christ's name may go outward to be glorified, then we're learning to be abundant the way we need to learn it. I dare say many of you think you want to learn this lesson, but it might not be quite as easy of a lesson as you think it is. The third lesson is that he had to learn to be amazed. If you look at verse 12, it says, I know how to be abased, a and I know how to abound. This is the part I want you to notice. Everywhere and in all things, so that's just everything in my life, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. You know, when all after we've been abased and we've been abundant over and over again, which is what he's talking about, You've had a lot, you had nothing. You've been made fun of, you've been exalted. You had a lot, had nothing, been exalted, been made fun of. Over and over again, over and over again, over and over again. Maybe you thought sooner or later he would let you stay at the top place on both of those. Uh, somehow you, most of us believe that contentment is found here. Contentment ain't got anything to do with that. It's got nothing to do with the place. Contentment has nothing to do with what you got. It's got nothing to do with whether or not somebody speaks well of you. It's got nothing to do with any of that. That's not contentment. When after being abased and abundant over and over again, a man may only be end up being proud, not content. What do I mean by that? You ever heard... Uh, Veterans, and I'm not making fun of veterans here, so don't take this the wrong way. You ever heard a veteran who's been in war talking about the war? Yeah, it was yeah, and we just we barely got out of there. And, and the thing that they hated then and made them so miserable, the very thing they're proudest of, you know. And what and they think now they're content because they're not in that. And what they may only be is proud. I'm sorry. Pride is not contentment. Hello? I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm just trying to tell the truth. A lot of people think because they've gone through a lot and they were heroic and they got something done that now they're contented. And all they really are is proud of the man they think they are. That doesn't necessarily represent contentment. What he thinks is contentment may only be pride. Pride. You see, when we can survive the ups and downs and still praise the Lord for his amazing grace, because t'was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. And with Paul, it is by grace you've been saved. He says, and, and God's grace was not weak toward me. Who talks about grace more than Paul? And all he had survived. I was going exactly the opposite way of the way I should have. But the Lord's grace reached down and pulled me in. You hear Paul talking, bragging about, yeah, we had two or three of them stoned. I never see that in any of his writings. It's funny. We'll tell war stories, though. We'll tell our horrible stories and almost laugh about them. But he doesn't do that. Have you noticed that? He didn't tell his war stories that way. He tells his war stories since he found Jesus, which is different. When we have learned to go up and down, barely surviving, barely surviving, yet singing the Lord's praises and the praises unto his grace as we press onward, then we're starting to learn to be amazed, not at ourself, but at God who got us through. We're amazed we made it through. Folks, there's a contentment that comes when you're just amazed you lived. 
Instead of thinking you got to be proud of who you are, you're amazed you're alive. Amen? That's, that's when contentment starts to hit you. Somebody's complaining about their car didn't start this morning. You're glad my heart started this morning. Amen? It changes you. And then fourthly, he had to learn to be assisted. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ's strength, a rich man can be content. Well, there's no problem in that. Really? You think everybody that's got money is content. Well, why is it that they're working so hard to get more of it? If everybody who's rich is so content, do you think that the only thing people want who've got riches is the money? No, they want the stuff that you can get with the money. Or they want power, or they want prestige. They want the same kind of junk you want. They just want more of it because they've gotten a taste for it now, and now they want more. Can a rich man be content? Yes, he can. But I thought rich men had plenty. You ever heard of a guy named Haman? The only thing he lacked was he wanted one guy to kneel to him. And he couldn't get that one. He's the most powerful man in the kingdom of Babylon. And he wants this one guy, just one more guy. I need to get him to bow to me. You see, sometimes you can have it all and be miserable and not content. So, but through Christ, even a rich man can learn to be content. Well, through Christ, strengthening, that is, and through Christ's strength, a poor man can learn to be content. That's right. I know it, it is the goal of all of us to have more. Now, that might be covetous, but it is our goal. You say, that's not my goal. Liar, liar, pants on fire. It is our goal to be doing better than we used to do. It is our goal for our children that they'll do better than we did. It is an appropriate thing, especially if you consider yourself to be poor. If you're poor and you're in terrible debt today, you feel in despair. Some of you sitting here are facing debts that are scaring you silly. And it probably should. Because you've never faced that one before. To a degree, it is frightening. But what I want to suggest to you is, if you're poor today, but you know the Lord, it doesn't matter. And by the way, guess what? All debts are canceled upon death. You don't have to pay anybody back. As far as I know, there's no payment plan in heaven. You're done, and just leave it to your family to take care of. <laughs> Seek, if you can, of course, to superior skill, to steady perseverance, to temperate, to thriftiness, to raise yourself up a little bit. But in the final analysis, if you're going to be content, you're going to be content through Jesus and your relationship with him. Well, what about those who are sick? Well, through Christ's strength, a sick man can be content. That's right. You can pray for the deliverance of your sickness, and you should. You should ask God to heal you absolutely. But after you prayed for healing and prayed for healing and prayed for healing, and you might ask Paul about that. He had this thorn thing. And after you've prayed and prayed and prayed that it would all come right, you might need to just simply learn to be content. Well, how could I possibly do that? Well, I don't know. I don't want to preach too hard on this one because right now I am not publicly sick. I didn't say I wasn't privately sick, but I am not publicly sick, right? You're not publicly sick either. Don't look at me funny. So you don't know it either. I probably got something wrong with me, just like everybody else in this room. Amen? Isn't that true? Everybody in here has got the symptoms leading to what will kill you one day. It's already happening. We are already with problems. And if you don't recognize that and you think only people with cancer are in that state, you have been misled. Every one of us has a weakness within our body right now which will lead to our death. Hello? Okay, so get past that because that's negative. But, but is there such a thing as being content even in your sickness? I like Aesop's fables. You like Aesop's fables? It tells a story about when Jupiter, everybody was complaining. So Jupiter called everybody in. He says, okay, I'll tell you what you do. You come in here and you lay your problems out on the table and anybody can pick up somebody else's problems. And so they did that. They thought that was a great idea. 
the guy that was blind, you know, he, he was looking for sight and he thought that sight, but he was willing to take somebody else's problem of poverty until by and by he got a taste of poverty. A guy in poverty couldn't wait to get some money, so he was willing to take the sickness of the rich man until by and by he got a taste of what it's like to be rich and be deathly ill. Until about a half hour to an hour later, everybody came back and said, can I just get back my problem? And I just get back my problem. Now, I can't speak to that too harshly because I know some people are going through some really tough things. But Paul had to learn to be assisted even in his thorn. Through Christ's strength, whether for richer or for poorer, whether in sickness or in health, whether for better or for worse, we can say by faith, I am content. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I am content. So when we have learned to bear all things, to believe all things, to hope all things, to endure all things, being strengthened by Christ to do so, not in our own power, but by Christ's power we're able to do it, we have learned to be assisted to get through this life. And I need God's assistance, don't you? Just to make it through. So Paul had to learn how to be abased. Somebody got to step on you. For you to learn that. Amen. And then he learned how to be abundant. That's a tough sell. People say that's not hard. You been there yet? And then he learned how to be amazed that God got him through. And then he learned how to be assisted. And those are all educational things that are not easy to pass through. A wealthy uh, employer overheard one of his employees saying, You know what? If I had a thousand dollars right now in my hand, I would be perfectly content. Knowing that wealth didn't really bring uh, contentment, the employer went over to him and says, You know, I've always wanted to meet someone who is perfectly content, so I'm going to grant you your desire. And he wrote a check out right then for $1,000 and handed it to the young lady. And then he walked away, but he overheard her saying to her co-worker as he walked away, Why, oh, why didn't I ask for $2,000? There once was a stone cutter who was dissatisfied with himself and his position in life. He felt it so lowly. And one day he saw a merchant pass by where he was cutting stones. And he saw how finely dressed he was and people respecting him and he obviously had money. And he thought to himself, oh, I wish I could be that merchant. And suddenly, poof, he was that merchant. And as he walked along into the streets with the money and people paying attention to him, suddenly a high official, much higher than him, passed by like a king. And he was dressed nicely, and he's in this carrying sedan that they're carrying him through town. And he just thinks, look at that. Now that's power. That's true power. That's what I want. And poof, suddenly he was the high official. And as he's sitting in his silk sedan, going along the streets, and he's enjoying the luster of it all, he begins to realize how hot he is in that sedan. The sun is making him sweat like nobody's business. He's just sweating like crazy. And he thinks to himself, now the sun, now that's power. And poof, suddenly, he was the sun. And he felt so powerful, making everybody hot. And suddenly, a big dark cloud came across the earth and just took away all of his power. And he's like, ah, oh, man, there's power right there to be the cloud and to knock out all the sun. Poof, suddenly he's the cloud. And he's thinking, now nah, I can stop the sun. I'm the most powerful thing in the world. About that time, a big wind came along and blew him totally off of where he was at. And he thought, man, now that's power. I wish I could have the power of that wind. Poof. Suddenly, he's the power of the wind. He's blowing trees, and he's blowing houses over. And he thinks, now I've got the power. I can do anything I want. And about that time, he's blowing on a rock, big rock. It's not moving at all. He can't move it at all. It won't budge, and he thinks, now that's power. That giant rock is true power. Poof. He's the rock. And he thinks, now I've got power. Nothing can move me. And about that time, he hears tick, 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 tick. And there's a stone cutter way down at his base, chopping away at the stone. 
contentment has to be learned. So if we really want to stop complaining, seek the disciplines that will bring it. You have it before you. Can you be content? You can, but you've got to be willing to go to school on it. If you're here today and you've never given your life to the Lord, the first place to start in that school is to repent of your sins, confess the precious name of Jesus, and be baptized. That's the invitation to you to begin the walk of contentment. Won't you come right now as we stand and as we sing?